everything possible to assist the pilot. But suddenly the transmission was cut off. The plane had crashed into the icy waters. Four helicopters operating nearby began searching the area with, within minutes of the emergency call. But they found no evidence of the plane and no survivors. The aircraft had been traveling without water survival gear, leaving its four passengers with even, with even less of a chance to make it through the ordeal. Fiercely cold Cook Inlet, with its unpredictable glacier currents, is considered among the most dangerous waters in the world. It can claim a life in minutes, and that day it claimed four. Kirk adds these thoughts to his story. He says, for reasons we'll never know, the pilot of that doomed aircraft chose not to use resources that were at his disposal. He did not have enough fuel. He did not have the proper survival equipment. Perhaps he had not taken the time to get the day's weather report. Whatever the case, he did not use the resources that were available, and in this instance, the consequences were fatal. A couple questions come to my mind. One is, how many other people do you suppose have died needlessly like these four people did because someone didn't manage the resources that they had at their disposal because of someone's neglect? How many people do you think might have died in various accidents or whatever? A second question comes to my mind, and that is, how many people do you think have died without Jesus Christ, spiritually speaking, because of others, people were poor stewards of the resources that God had placed in their life? Stewardship, it's critical. It's important. It's vital. Stewardship, God gives us resources to use, and it's not just to use because it's fun to you, just because just he likes us. It's for a purpose. It's for a purpose. He's given you resources for a reason. It's for always, always, always. When in doubt, it's always for his glory and his gain, for his kingdom work here on earth. Now restates this also. The stewardship of resources is a serious business, and, it's God's, and God's will is that we, we give it serious attention. This demands that we have the right perspective on our resources, and that is possible only if we have the right focus on our source. How true is that? So often, we get caught up on personal agenda. So often, we get caught up on acquiring things for ourselves. So often, we get caught up in me, my, and I, we lose perspective on the source. It's always going back to the source. Maybe you remember Elizabeth Dole, former Secretary of State. She said this about stewardship. Life is not just a few years to spend on self-indulgence and career advancement. It is a privilege, a responsibility, and a stewardship to be lived according to a much higher calling. I don't know if you noticed the songs that we sang today. Did you notice these songs? Let me just let me just toss these out. You are my supply, my breath of life, still more awesome than I know. You are my reward worth living for, still more awesome than I know. All of you is more than enough for all of me. For every thirst and every need, you satisfy me with your love, and all I have in you is more than enough. We sang it. You believe it? Let my life song sing to you. Let my life song sing to you. I want to sign your name to the end of this day, knowing that my heart was true. Let my life song sing to you. We sang it. Do we believe it? Be an offering. All you are and own. All you'll ever be, lay it at his feet. Be an offering, sowing seeds of hope on a world in need. Be an offering. We sang it. Do we believe it? And if anyone has the uh, 
forethought to say, yeah, Tim, I believe that. Let me just say that I should be able to see it as a reflection in your life. And so should other people. Um, a much higher calling, she says. As followers of Jesus Christ, stewardship is, is an important business. And too many people, I believe, this is my opinion, so take it for that. Too many people find their way to the cross of Christ for salvation, and that is a great thing. And instead of them walking beyond the cross into the plan that God has for them, they simply turn and walk back into the life they came from. Yeah, maybe they, they're part of a church. Maybe they're, oops, let me back up. Maybe they're attending a Bible study now. Maybe they're not swearing as much. Maybe they're not drinking. Maybe they're not doing the other things they used to do. Maybe they seem a little bit nicer. Maybe all that. But they're not living beyond the cross in the life that God has destined for them. Is that you? Did you, when you came to Jesus, did you stop at the cross and say, this is it, this is all I want? Because that's not what he wants for you. I believe this. I believe that if we say that, if we stop at the cross, and don't live beyond the cross into the life that's complete and full that God has planned for us, then that is an injustice toward Jesus and for what he died for. He died for more than you just be saved. Christian means little Christs. That's what it means. So if we're going to be little Christ, don't we have to be a reflection of him and walk this earth like Jesus did? And stewardship is a big part of that. It's not just about money. I mean, a lot of people will say stewardship is about money. Oh, Tim's going to do a stewardship Sunday. We're going to talk about giving the church more money. It's not about that. And I'm pretty sure, I haven't gone back to all my messages, but I'm pretty sure I have never preached about you giving more money to this church family. I had one person say when I first started from one of the churches say, hey, you know, we're looking pretty behind on the budget. You probably better be preaching on giving more. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, when God tells me to preach on giving more, I'll preach on giving more. But until then, we'll just let God handle it. <laughs> and, and well, you know, I don't know. And I said, you know, and God has, I, would you say God has blessed us? I think he, I believe he has blessed us. And, you know, and it's not because of my preaching, that's for sure, but it's because of him and his goodness and his grace to us. But living as stewards of everything we have, it's not about preaching for more money. If anything, it's about preaching that we live a life as a true follower of Jesus Christ. And what does that look like? Now, you have in your bulletins, you should have anyway, maybe it wasn't in the bulletin, actually it wasn't, we had to give it later, a, um, a survey form for today's message. If you agree with the article and stuff, you leave it on your pew. Do you have, or did those get out? Those, okay, it's a white piece of paper. I neglected to ask someone to read that beforehand, so would somebody one like to read this article for us today? Who would volunteer to do that? Lori? Thank you. Let me put it up on the screen. Lori is going to read the article and see what it says and if we can agree with this. Whoops. Um, back up here, Tim. There we go. We believe that everything belongs to God who calls the church to live in faithful stewardship of all that God has entrusted to us and to participate now in the rest in justice which God has promised. Our job is to live as faithful followers of Jesus Christ. That's all he's asking. That's what this stewardship is about. So please open your Bibles, if you would, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verse 35. And while you're going there, I'm going to go to another piece of Scripture. But I want you to follow along when I get to Luke. Luke 12, 35. Um, this Scripture, I'm going to reread what Tim read, but I'm going to read it from the English Standard Version. And this is how this reads. In fact, it's up on the screen here. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. Now, let me, I'm not going to preach a, the whole message on this, because this, this scripture right here, these two verses, 
could be an entire message, but I just want to real quick note what the important highlights of this are. First of all, it says that, that this is how one should regard us. This is how a person from the outside should look and see us and have an understanding of us. This is what they should see when they see you as a follower of Jesus. And it says, as servants of Christ. It means you're not a secret agent. No, no undercover agents in this, in this army of God's. No secret Christians here. We all, they should see us, they should say, that person's a Christian. They should know. And going on, number, number two is, they should all see us as stewards, stewards or managers of the mysteries of God. And, and that, the mysteries of God, I look at it this way. The mystery is that the gospel message is very simple. An illiterate person can understand the gospel message, believe, and be saved. So simple. But yet at the same time, the world's greatest theologians find that the, the, the message of the gospel is so deep that they can't fathom what it's all about. That is the mystery. How does it work like this? And then going on, now you need to get this. Moreover, it is required. What does the word required mean? Does it mean it's an option? Does it, it is, yeah, mandatory. It is non-optional. It is required of followers of Jesus to what? To be found trustworthy. To be found means when the Lord returns or when you go to the Lord. And what you are, you're judged on what you have done and what you have not done with what he's given you, the talents, the gifts, and how have you been a steward on those things? Trustworthy. Could he give it to you and he could trust you with it? We're going to get into that now in Luke here. So it is a high calling to be a, a steward of the manager of what God has given us, the resources he has given us. Luke 12, 35, it's not going to be on the screen. Do you, anybody want a Bible to follow along in the Bible? Anybody need a Bible? Okay, we're good. Luke 12, 35 from the NIV reads like this. <clears throat> be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. Like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet. This sounds like the, the ten virgins that, that he also talked about, doesn't it? So that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. There's the being found part that I just talked about. Okay? Being found trustworthy. When he comes, that's the part. I tell you the truth, going on. I tell you the truth. He will dress himself, the master, to serve, will have them recline at the table, the servants, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. But understand this, Jesus says, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready. Why? Because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? The Lord answered, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food and allowance at the proper time? This is the issue of stewardship, of managing. It will be good for that, verse 43, it will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. When the Lord returns, it'll be good for you to be at work. It won't be good for you to be sitting around. It won't be good for you to be just going about your own business. It'll be good for you to be going about the master's business, won't it? Isn't that what he says here? It's Jesus' words, not Tim's, okay? Let's go on. I, verse 44, I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. He asked him to do a job. He did the job. He returns. He said, man, this guy can be trusted. I'm going to give him everything. I'm going to let him take care of everything. That's what he's telling us, isn't it? That he's getting entrusted things to us. Entrusted things to you and I. How are we doing with it? 
Sometimes people say, well, you know, he's never given me this or I've never gotten that or boo hoo, what, I, you know. Well, you know what? Maybe some people can't be trusted with those bigger things because they can't be trusted with the little things. Let me go on here. But suppose, verse 45, but suppose the servant says to himself, you know, my master's taking a long time in coming. And then he begins to beat the men servants and maid servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. In other words, I, I can do whatever I want. I can him, and at an hour he is not aware of. The result is he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers understand this servant knew the master was part of the household of the master and was was master was chosen and allowed him given him something to to be in charge of all of a sudden he goes on his own not doing what the master wants and what happens he's cutting him to pieces and making him be with the unbelievers 47 that servant who knows his master's will and does not get ready or does not do what his master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know the things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. So everybody's getting beat. That's on the other side. That's what it sounds like anyway. <laughs> From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. To me, as I read this, I see that our stewardship is linked to our belief, is linked to our salvation. If you tell me you're a follower of Jesus, I expect that you're going to be a good steward. I expect that you're going to be a good manager of the resources that God has given us. And that looks so many different ways. Our primary calling as followers of Jesus, as servants of God, is to be stewards or managers of his household. It's God who, through Christ Jesus, has given us new life. He's also given you and me spiritual gifts so we can serve in the church family, so we can serve in the community, so we can serve however he wants us to serve. And the result of not using those gifts and living beyond the cross into a full and complete life of a sold-out follower of Jesus, the results of not doing that is incredibly costly as I read this scripture. One area, let me look at a few areas that I think that we can work on when it comes to stewardship. And I, I look at these because it hits me in the face. Time. Time. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to be good managers of time. I believe that a good steward takes care of time because time belongs to God. It is not yours. We think it's ours, but it's not yours. Even you retired people, it's not yours. <laughs> you think God is giving you more time so you don't have to work. No, he's giving you more time for something else maybe. But you look at the scripture in, in Psalm 31, 15. The psalmist says this. Let's go here. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of, of my enemies and from those who persecute me. But the psalmist understood that his times, our times, are in the hands of God. They're not in ours. We think we've got this time, but we really, really don't. And Paul spoke of the use of time to the church in Ephesus. He said, he said this. He said, therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time. Why? Because the days are evil. We need to make the most of our time. And I'm going to tell you, for me, it's hard. It's really hard. Um, you know, you get together with somebody. I, I'm, I'm going to probably get in trouble with this tomorrow or today. But after, after I work out, Zeke and I sit there and yak a little bit. I enjoy it, and it's good. But it's probably not the best use of Zeke's time or my time. Well, on Mondays, it's not too bad. But, you know, you know what I mean? I'm not trying to slam you, but it, it is. You know, and... And understand that fellowshipping like that is a good thing. I'm not opposed to that. I, you know, yucking it up with people every now and then. Those are, those are healthy and those are good things. But the point is when that starts to consume things that we need to be doing instead, then we're poor managers of time. And it, it can go in, in other ways. But way back to the beginning of everything, God called his people to keep special periods of, of rest. And that was time. Days and weeks were appointed. 
In the Old Testament, the seventh day was holy because it was the day God rested from the work of creation. That's keeping track of time. A day is a unit of time, a measurement of time. The Sabbath was also holy because of God delivering the Hebrews from slavery. Remember those things. So today, we're celebrating coming to the Lord. And today, as the church family, on this day, it's the first day of the week. And it's a time that we give to the Lord. He wants all of our time. He wants and deserves our time. And it's, you know what? It's not just on Sundays. He wants and deser- deserves every minute of time. Did you know that God wants your calendar? He does. I'm, and I'm going to tell you what. I'm, I'm, I need a mirror up here because it's really easy. I should be preaching to myself on this stuff. But, but you know, so often we write things on the calendar. I'm going to go do this and I'm going to do that, you know. How many times do you say, Lord, you want me to do this? Lord, yeah, check in. Lord, do you want me, want me to go do that? What the Bible says, we, should, we say we'll do this and we'll do that, but we should say, no, if the Lord wills, I'll do this and do that. Yeah, I can go do that for you. Yeah, I can go do that for you. Next thing you know, you're overburdened, you're overrun. And you think God wants you to be just so, so overrun with stuff that you really have no time for him? I don't think he wants us to live that way, but we do that, don't we? We do it for other reasons, self-esteem, and I want them to like me, so I'll go and help. I mean, whatever the issues are. I think we need to be careful, except for when your pastor asks you to do something. Then you probably shouldn't ask. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> or when the pastor's wife does. <laughs> but um, we, ha- we have to understand that he wants that from us. And the other thing is, this probably covers everything, and... God, probably the best way to understand stewardship is to recognize and live out Psalm 24.1. The earth is the Lord's and a few things that are in it. Right? No, no. Everything that's in it. Does that include my guitar? Yeah. Does that, does that include? Yeah, it includes. <laughs> it includes Sadie. Uh, the problem with that is now somebody might say, you gotta go. You gotta go take care of Sadie, and I'll say it's the Lord's. She's the Lord's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everything we have is the Lord's. And are we taking care of things? Or when God blesses us in a way, and we have a, a thing, a stuff. You know, we we are inundated with stuff. How many people know that we got more stuff than we need, and we just let it set out and let it get ruined, or we don't take care of things. We need to take. I'm not. You know. I'm kind of a big for trying to keep things inside, take care of things the best that I can. Sometimes I'm just ignorant on how to take care of things. You know, that happens to us. But taking care of things is really important, as well as taking care of ourselves. You know, Zeke gave me a compliment today, but I noticed the other day when we were working out, he was looking a little thinner in the face. You know, you, you, and Debbie's going, oh, please. She, Debbie, Debbie's thinking, don't feed the animal. Don't feed the monster. You know. No, I mean, but our bodies... The, are the Lord's, are they not? And are we not to take care of the temple of the Holy Spirit? You know, and I've been guilty of not taking care of the temple. I mean, the temples need to be shingled, re-shingled several <laughs> times, you know. <laughs> so we need to do that. This article in the Confession of Faith, it says this also. We acknowledge that God as creator is owner of all things. And I agree with that. And I think if I believe that if we keep that and understand that and live like that, that is really living beyond the cross. It's living in, in a life of order. I look at Genesis 1, 28, where Adam and Eve, God's sending them on their way, or not quite there yet, but he said this. God blessed them, Adam and Eve, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, which is a tall order at that point because there's only two of them, <laughs> Right? And, and, and it says, subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Subdue it. Take charge of it. Rule over it. It's yours. Not the earth isn't, isn't, for you, isn't yours. I mean, earth is yours, not the other way around. And so often we, we want people, people want to take care of the earth so to the point that they worship the created instead of the creator. Do you know what I'm saying here? I'm just coming right out and say it. The tree huggers, the tree huggers, you know. And people don't have a concept of, 
a, 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 a balanced concept of what does it take to take care of the environment, to take care of the earth. There are resources for us. You know, God said be fruitful, multiply. He meant fill the earth. He meant to take care of what I've given you here and use it to what you want. That's probably a, 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 great, a great thing for Graymont, right? You know, we're just being doing what God told us to do, right? Is that, no. May not want to use that, though, Daryl. I don't know. But we're called to care for the earth. And part of that is to know when to plant, know when to harvest, know when to let go, to let it rest. In, in the Old Testament, in the Bible, they had times they let the ground go fallow. They, they just let it go, let it rest. And that's all being part of a, a good steward and renewing the ground and everything you have. Um, and when it, when it comes to other things of stewardship, of managing the resources, it comes to like money and possessions, we're called to live simply and to help people in our church family. And we're called to, when we give on Sunday morning, we should give, what Paul say, cheerfully, happy, hot dog, we get to give money. That's what we should be doing. I don't see that much, but we should be doing that, you know. Yay! There's a Mars Hill Community Bible Church in Granville. They have what they call, they call them joy boxes. And as soon as they say joy boxes, we have joy boxes in the back that you can give when you go out if you want to. As soon as they say joy boxes, everybody starts going, yeah! <laughs> I just think that's a great mental attitude. There's other things that we have in the library. Um, I believe Linda might have put them, or somehow we have some books from Everence on stewardship. On, on being that, and if you want to know more about stewardship, Linda through Everence can help you um, get to know more about, about those things, about books. There's plenty of resources for that. In fact, um, I'm not sure if they're in your bulletin, but we have some webinars coming up on from er Everence. And all this stuff that we're offering, that Linda's offering, is to help you in the area of stewardship. You know, you, you might want to think, oh, this is just trying to sell us something. It's just trying to do this. No, no, no. We do these things to help you so you can be better stewards of the resources that God has given to us. You know, I believe that if we, as we depend on the wisdom of, on God, we become dependent on God's wisdom and not our own, we're not to be anxious about stuff. Matthew 6, Jesus says, don't be anxious about what you're going to wear. Don't be anxious about what you're going to eat. You know, so to consider the birds of the air, you know, how God takes care of them. Consider the lilies of the field, how God clothes them. Doesn't he love you more than this? He says, don't be anxious about all this stuff, you know. But he, what does he say at the end of that section? He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and what happens and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. We can't be true servants of God and allowing our lives to be ruled by desires of external things. External stuff. Thing is, all too often we miss the mark when it comes to being God's managers of his things, of his stuff, of his gifts. And it's usually because we have an agenda that doesn't line up with God's. God may prompt us. We might be reading his word and his word will tell us, give us, prompt us to do something. And our response may be, but God, I want to do this instead. The Holy Spirit one day, we might be going along, and the Holy Spirit says, you need to do this. And we might say, no, 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 I don't have time for that. But I want to do this instead. God and His Spirit prompt us all the time. How do we respond? Do we respond with another answer? I'll tell you what, I've got a video that will help us in this area. So let's take a look at this. I got a, got a big butt gigantic if I'm going to be blunt about it and you know what the funny thing is I got several big butts and, and, and before you before you discard me or, or wince at the disgusting notion of that I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that possibly you have at least one big butt as well yeah you like that hurts a little huh let me tell you something let me just tell you something okay everybody we know has a big butt and more often than not it's the thing that actually gets in the way of us living a consistent life for Jesus yeah, I think you know what I'm talking about. But I'm going to expound a little bit, okay? See if you can recognize some of these butts. But I have to work more. But my favorite TV show is on. But my kids have practice. But i got to tweet something. But it's such a beautiful day. But I'm just not in the mood. But I deserve a break today. You see, everything. 
kind of interferes with my life of, of just living an authentic life for God, okay? And more often than not, it always has something to do with some sort of but, okay? Even the littlest of but can distract me. It really can. The littlest but can make me think, well, I'm not going to pray today. I'm not going to think about it today. I'm not going to deny myself. I'm not going to read the Bible, blah, blah, blah. Whatever God asks me to do, I seem to have a but for it and get away, okay? And the most horrendously big but of all time is the but that gets in the way of me just hanging out with God and reading His Word. It's true. Think about it. All the times you're about to open that, and all of a sudden a big giant butt gets in the way. A butt, much like one of these. But I got a farm bill, but I'm tired, but the game's over, but I read last Tuesday, but I gotta check Facebook, but I don't like Leviticus, but it's too hot in here, but I, I just don't like books, but I don't understand it, but it's boring. But what does that have to do with me in the 21st century? Those are some ugly butts, people. Let's just call them what they are, ugly. Ugly butts. Okay, and there's a lot more to them, sad but true. Here's a list, although not exhaustive, of some of the most popular butts known to mankind. But I don't have enough money yet. But others will think that I'm a nerd if I carry the Bible. But they won't like me if I talk about Jesus. But I don't know if God will do what I ask. But I just can't get motivated. But I'm afraid. But I don't have all the answers. But the small group is the same night as Monday Night Football. But can I just let my life speak for itself? But I'm not happy. But that's not my gift. But that's the pastor job. But I don't know how to pray. But I can't believe that. But I don't know where to start. But everybody else is having fun. Butts abound, friend. But, 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 but. Here a but, there a but. Everywhere a but, but. Okay? And, and, and the most overused but of all time, but I just don't have enough time. Really? Oh, come on. We have a lot of buts. God has given us a real simple word. Okay? If we learn it and we share it and we teach it and we live by it, then see, God gets glorified, people benefit, and then we get blessed. That's why we do what we do. That's the why behind the but. Okay? And ultimately, that's the whole point I'm trying to make here, my fellow butt lovers, is if your butt is bigger than your why, then your butt's too big. Okay, it's time to, metaphorically speaking, snap into a Slim Jim. Okay, let's slap on some spiritual shape-ups and hit the road a little bit so we can just manage the butts a little bit. That's all we're trying to do. That's what we're talking about. Let's minimize the excuses. Let's shrink the butts. Shrink the butts. Say it with me. Shrink the butts. That's what we need to do. And you and I can do that together. We can conquer this. You and I can do it if we start the day, okay? I know we can. Let's just do it. No ifs, ands, or... Yeah. I think you get it. You get it? Pearl Bartel once said, if I fail or succeed in my stewardship of life in proportion to how convinced I am to God, I fail or succeed in my stewardship of, li of life in proportion to how convinced I am that God, that life belongs to God. I can't read. Isn't that true? So the question is, how convinced are you or are your butts getting in the way? Father God.